Well, hello and welcome to the second episode of our series of conversations on digital rights, a series of discussions on the challenges of access and use of digital media in Europe. We are very happy to be talking with Sarah Chander today. Sarah, hello and thank you for joining us today. Hi, thanks for having me. So Sarah, you are a senior policy advisor at European Digital Rights, a network of NGOs, experts, advocates, and academics working to defend and advance digital rights across the continent. You lead the organization's policy work on artificial intelligence and non-discrimination with respect to digital rights. You have a great interest and expertise in the field of racial and social justice, uh, having worked for the European Network Against Racism and been involved in movements against immigration detention. It is a pleasure having you with us today. And taking part in this discussion, we also have two colleagues, respectively from the European Free Alliance, IFA, and the European Free Alliance Youth. Adrian, Adrian, hello. Adria, you are IFA's strategy advisor, and aside, you have always been involved in several youth associations and movements, especially focusing on the right to self-determination. As a biotechnologist, you aim to combine your scientific career with a social impact to improve people's lives. And Adrian, you are the coordinator of the youth branch of IFA. You are Basque and have long been involved in politics and in youth movements, campaigning for peaceful and democratic self-determination for the Basque country and beyond. Thank you both very much for taking part in this discussion. And the first question will be asked by uh, Adrian. Good morning, everybody, and good morning, uh, Simona. So um, our first question is regarding um, that the European Commission recently put forward a legislative proposal for artificial intelligence. Its aim, uh, as the Commission puts it, is to address the risks generated by certain users of uh, artificial intelligence through a set of rules. What is your initial take on this proposal that was recently released? How do you think it should be improved? Yeah, so uh, this has been quite uh, some a long time in, in the making. So many people that are working in digital rights have been waiting a very long time for this artificial intelligence proposal. Um, some of you might remember, but back in 2020, the European Commission released a white paper which set out its intentions for how it would re regulate um, artificial intelligence. Uh, there was a lot of interest in this, particularly because um, of a leak that happened, which said that the European Commission was considering a moratorium on uses of facial recognition, um, which is a big deal for the privacy community, for human rights communities, because it touches on this topic of mass surveillance. Um, so here's some, that's a little bit of the context of this. Now, I think um, it's important to recognize that the artificial intelligence um, regulation has kind of two sort of, I would say competing, but let's say two aims, two objectives. One of the objectives is the idea that um, AI should be um, promoted um, for Europe to become an, a leader in AI um, and such that the European market can, can, can compete on a global scale. Um, as such, therefore, the European Commission has called this like a framework of excellence. So basically, how can we develop the infrastructure and the skills and basically the whole climate needed in Europe to really make Europe um, a leader in AI. Um, the other objective, and this is maybe the one that I think I will speak a little bit about more today, is that um, the regulation is supposed to make sure that AI is trustworthy. So regulate um, what AI is uh, put onto the market so that people in Europe can trust it so that it respects their fundamental rights. Um, now, EDRI have been really interested in this regulation for many reasons, uh, because AI has a potential to impact in many ways um, our privacy, but also other fundamental rights like uh, how whether or not we will be discriminated 
um, if we encounter certain AI systems, whether they're used in different contexts, um, and also many other um, fundamental rights too, like our freedom of expression, our right to a fair trial. It could be any um, human right, depending on where the AI, which sector and which context the AI system is deployed. Um, what I think was really striking uh, about the AI regulation when it was launched uh, this April uh, by the Commission was that it contained um, a list of prohibitions, so certain uses of AI that the Commission calls unacceptable uses. They cannot be used, they are prohibited, they are prohibited and therefore um, cannot be used or put into the onto the market. Now, this is a huge uh, win, I say, and a huge step, um, mainly because uh, this was not necessarily foreseen in the original plans. However, it was called for by civil society. So back in um, January of this year, EDRI, um, along with 61 other civil society organizations, basically called for the European Commission to ensure that the upcoming proposal had red lines and by red lines we meant what are the certain uses that are impermissible that are unacceptable that are not compatible with fundamental rights in a free society. Um, the uses that we sort of outlined were, for example, the use of AI in a way that it would enable or facilitate mass surveillance, uh, but also other uses like um, using AI systems, automated systems to determine access to some of the most essential public goods like education, like welfare and social security services, like healthcare, um, but also things like predictive policing, um, which these are systems in essence which use historical data to basically determine where and by whom crime will happen in the future. Uh, this area of pre-criminality, so basically assessing people, uh, processing their data before they have even committed a crime. Um, all of these uses were not necessarily included by the European Commission in their prohibitions, but the very fact that this regulation included some prohibitions is a huge positive step and can really, um, is one, I think, good indicator that the the regulation has potential, basically, because it acknowledges that, yes, there's a sort of pro industry underlying to this to this regulation It's about the free market It's about the single market promoting AI as a service and a product. But also there is a fundamental rights um, angle to it. And therefore, by prohibiting some harmful uses of AI, it shows that this fundamental rights angle is being sort of at least like prioritized to some extent. So this is one, I think, positive thing that we can really say. But generally, apart from that, um, I think we have to look at from a more critical lens. So I'll just say some some things that I think that could be better um, with the regulation now. Um, I've just mentioned a few uses of AI um, that I think are harmful and that civil society have really pointed out to. Um, when I say civil society, I'm not just talking about digital rights organizations, but also anti-racist organizations, LGBTI organization, uh, organizations, um, organizations that represent the right to a fair trial, such organizations like this have come into a coalition to say, okay, well, there are some uses, for example, predictive policing, but also the uses of algorithms to determine uh, potential rates of recidivism for uh, purposes of uh, sentencing in, in Europe. Uses of AI in the context of migration control or at the border, there are some uses that are very harmful. And actually, there's a big question mark about whether the EU's rules can actually help us with those uses. So basically, in summary, the EU's rules is that it has set out in it for itself a categorization determined by the European Commission of what constitutes a high risk AI system, a high risk application. Now, it determines on fundamental rights grounds a list of, of, of basically high risk AI systems included in that list are um, AI systems, certain AI systems used in the criminal justice context, so many of the ones I've already sort of explained, um, but also AI systems in the use of migration control, analyzing using AI automated uh, um, systems to analyze uh, people, whether it comes to their emotions, um, 
polygraphs, whether it, whether or not they're lying, um, in the context of the visa application process or other aspects of the um, of the of the migration control context. Now, um, the, uh, I also should have mentioned that there's also on that list um, AI in the educational context. Um, and also various um, systems which are used in some ways to surveil workers and uh, in so in, in an employment context too. There are many other uses, but I'll just um, focus on these for now. Um, basically, under the EU's rules, uses like this are categorized as high risk. And what does it mean when something is categorized as high risk? Essentially, then the provider, so the developer of that system, the, who, whoever has designed it and created it, under the EU's regulation has to go through a series of checks of things that they have to ensure before that system goes um, onto the market. Now, these uh, rules include things like transparency. Uh, they include things like ensuring that there's sufficient and accurate data quality. Um, and also that the system is um, robust um, amongst some other uses. Now, these rules, I think um, many people in digital rights would, would consider these are fine in themselves. The, such rules cannot hurt. And actually they may go some way to improve some small aspects of um, AI systems. However, the EU's process has essentially placed a lot of responsibility and power with the people, with the companies essentially that are developing the AI systems, with the companies responsible for putting the AI systems onto the market. This is problematic for a number of reasons, but one of them is, is that the, the EU has basically invested trust in such systems to self-assess for most cases, whether or not um, the products that these very companies are selling themselves are compliant with the law. Now, I think you don't have to be a rocket scientist to recognize that actually people with a vested interest in getting um, their product or service sold, um, basically they have an incentive to say that their system is compliant with the law. In particular, because the EU's own rules um, and their own standards are quite vague. So for example, uh, under Article 10, uh, the data quality requirement of providers, it will say things like um, ensuring reasonable assumptions and accuracy. However, these, these terms are very subjective and can differ very much depending on the AI system that we're talking about. So the vagueness of the provisions, in addition to the fact that the developers of AI self-assess their compliance with the law, mean that there's a huge gap in terms of protection um, and such that uh, there is a various sort of, like, sort of question mark, particularly among civil society, but also from others about whether these rules are sturdy enough, whether they're fit for purpose enough to ensure that vast fundamental rights um, harms don't occur. The second thing is, is that we have sort of have a framework now which is about regulating what AI systems go to market, but not about what AI systems are put into use. And all of the cases that I've talked about, so AI and migration control, AI used by the police, in many of these contexts, it's not just about how that system is designed, but how it is used and what context it is used in. Uh, many civil society have been for a long time arguing that you need some checks and balances at the points of use so that if, for example, um, police force in X sort of area says, oh, I want to use this AI system, there should be a number of criteria and a number of obligations and assessments that that police force should be taking before it puts into place those systems. The reason, and I think that we have narrowed it down quite a lot in our conversation around law enforcement and migration control, we've written elsewhere that actually there's a deeper story as to why there are quite soft um, rules about uses of AI in, in migration control and law enforcement. We've seen in other policy areas, for example, in the EU's Europol, proposed Europol update, but also in the EU's migration pact, that in itself, the EU has suggested that there are many benefits to using AI in these contexts. So 
we see for some extent that there is a vested interest at the EU level to promote the use of AI in policing and migration control. Therefore, there is some connection as to why the, the rules are so soft, because in some way the EU in other areas wants to facilitate the uptake of AI in the areas of migration control and, and law enforcement. However, therefore, we come to a point of a trade off, we have to say, okay, well, the EU wants to promote these uses, but also there are really severe fundamental rights risks with them. Uh, they might, um, and we can talk about this a bit later, they might uh, run the risk of discriminating against racialized communities, they might um, completely undermine the dignity and also the data protection rights of migrants who are on their way to Europe and traveling to Europe, exercising their right to claim asylum. With all of these things in mind, how do we come to a balance here? How can we, at the one hand, promote such uses of AI and at the other hand, say that we are making them use, uses trustworthy and making them compliant with human rights? This is one thing that Adria are really um, pushing for uh, to change, is to have um, a more rounded conversation now that the AI regulation is with the European Parliament to say, okay, so there are some uses that the AI, the AI regulation has not regulated strictly. It actually, it's said they're just high risk, but there are very few checks and most of the checks are self-assessment. That needs to change. And in fact, there should be an assessment before such systems are put into use about whether they are going to jeopardize fundamental rights. If there is going to be very much of a harm to people's fundamental rights, their safety, their dignity, and, and their right to not be discriminated against, then that system shouldn't be used, or it should be modified in a way that those harms do not arise. This is, I think, one of the main changes that we're looking for to see in the upcoming regulation. But I think a lot of it depends on the, the extent to which the European Parliament takes into account a wide range of views. So, so far, the AI regulation has been very, um, very uh, much a hot topic for digital rights organizations, but also for big tech. So we saw uh, a few weeks ago Politico's AI, Politico's AI Summit, um, the CEO of, of, um, of Google um, spoke at that uh, uh, summit to say that the EU is being too strict on AI systems and actually the fundamental rights-based safeguards were not um, conducive to innovation. Now, going forward, the European Commission has uh, the European Parliament in its way to love updating the regulation really needs to think about how it speaks to a wider range of organizations and people as well about um, AI and how it will impact our lives. Uh, it needs to make sure that it's having conversations with people, organizations that are reflecting digital rights, um, anti racism, LGBTI rights, disability rights, and it needs to make sure that it's rules that it's putting into place and how it changes the AI regulation is reflecting the human rights of all of those groups, um, not just the claims made by big business that we need more and more AI in order to be innovative and for EU to be a leader in AI. Uh, so with that, I'll stop. Thanks a lot, Sarah. It's, it's been a really interesting um, well, explanation on, 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 on the whole context given um, those new rules by the European Commission. I think it's clear that from what you said, the European Commission did have some positive um, steps, let's say, that uh, were not taken before and that in a way the EU always tries to present itself as sort of defender of uh, consumer rights and protection and, and, and so on. So perhaps these little steps go in that direction, but I think that it's clear from what you say that there definitely needs to be a lot of uh, civil society uh, push for uh, these protections to be enlarged and to be fully compliant with uh, human rights. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, and um, the next question is going to come from uh, Adria. Yeah, thank you. Good morning, Sarah. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Um, Still regarding this topic of the Commission's um, legislative proposal on AI, um, it is well known that digital tools tend to, let's say, reinforce discrimination patterns 
that exist in our societies. And one illustration of this is, for instance, facial recognition techniques or technologies that are not built um, to correctly identify the faces of people of color, and this leading to harmful mistakes. Um, what steps do you think that could and should be taken in this regulatory proposal and, and beyond to tackle the issue of racism um, in artificial intelligence at the European level? Yeah, definitely. It's a really good question. And I think that it's been one of the more um, sort of engaging areas of the AI debates where many people, even if you don't work in AI, you may have heard um, things about, for example, the coded bias documentary. You may have heard um, the fact that um, people um, in the US, for example, have been uh, falsely stopped and search or falsely even in some case arrested. Uh, because of AI systems that um, have basically falsely identified them because they're black. And really, uh, we have to take a moment to recognize the really amazing work that has been done by Joy Bolamwini, Deb Raji, Tim Gebru in the US, who really essentially did a really long, uh, many years of research to basically identify the problems with AI systems, how they are inaccurately uh, recognizing people with darker skin, uh, specifically women of color, black women and darker skinned women, and showing a real discrepancy between um, how such systems have identified so these groups with um, in comparison with white men. This is, I think, not just about the impact, but also pointing to a broader problem with the, the tech industry and also the industries um, developing um, technology and AI systems in particular is that they represent a really small subset of society and yet they have um, a lot of power to influence our world, particularly um, in the context of what I was saying earlier, we have policymakers like the European Commission saying that we need to promote AI, we need to use AI, we need to have AI used in all contexts, but AI is not perfect. And um, you will have heard many times that AI uh, amplifies existing inequalities in our society. So if developers are not um, thinking about the diversity of our society, then they will uh, intentionally or unintentionally encode these uh, discriminations into the products, into the services that they build. That's one part of the story. Now, this, in, this issue about misidentification with uh, facial recognition systems is um, a two-sided coin. So on the one hand, it's very important, and it's a one important aspect of the AI and racism debate, because as we see the more and more uptake of AI, we will see that its facial recognition is being used in more and more contexts. So you would have seen the example of um, an AI system which was not facial recognition, but it was um, designed to detect whether um, a hand was under a soap dispenser. And it was not able to recognize a darker skinned person's hand, but was able to, rec um, to, to recognize a white person's hand. You're also seeing the increased um, uptake of facial recognition systems to, to um, regulate entry into people's apartment buildings. If that happens in your apartment building and you happen to be a woman of color and the system cannot identify you, you may come up with a very serious uh, um, situation where you cannot get into your building. Um, Deb Raji said something very um, clearly once about saying if an AI system can't work for everyone, it shouldn't be used. And I think this is a really good way to put this. Um, the other side of the coin, though, is that the AI and racism debate is much broader than, and I, I think much deeper than the question of whether AI systems can categorize us and identify us equally. In some ways, um, it is important to have equality in the way um, AI systems in general work, right? It shouldn't be better to identify you than better to identify me. That That's obvious, right? However, there is a broader conversation, particularly in the privacy space and in the broader racial justice space, which says, why are such invasive systems, invasive systems used in these contexts? 
I did not, um, I do not I think that there has been a really a fuller public debate about whether we should use systems that, for example, use our facial data or other data uh, about our body. So this is called biometric data, um, data about my voice, data including my fingerprints, da data relating to my eye, eyes, scans of my eyes. All of this data is sensitive data, is protected um, more strongly in European data protection law than, in other, than other types of data. However, when it is introduced in, in particular contexts, we see that actually that there is potentially a very um, dangerous power relation that is being um, put, put across. So for example, biometrics such as eye scans and also facial recognition data has been seen to be used in the migration control context. Um, the EU funded um, over the past few years a project called the Eye Border Control Project, which was purportedly seeking to show that it could prove whether people were lying in the context of their visa applications, um, basically using different um, emotion recognition technology, which is in many cases disputed science, false science, to detect whether someone's lying. Um, this is a huge question around power. Uh, people that are trying to enter Europe, trying to get a visa, have no choice really to consent to the use of their facial data. Uh, the same in the in the humanitarian context. We've seen more and more examples across the world where in the administration of um, uh, humanitarian contexts like the refugee camps, in the administration of those uh, in those contexts, for example, for the identification or the delivery of food to people living in those contexts, Biometrics have been taken from them, such as their fingerprints, in some cases, eye scans, in some cases, facial recognition. Here we have a huge question of whether the use of such systems completely obliterate the notion of consent. Because you're supposed to consent to the use of your biometrics, however, if you're in a situation of that level of power imbalance, you need from something from the person that's seeking to take your data, can you really say that you've truly consented to the taking of that data? Broadly, though, I think that there's a question around um, the issue of sort of systematic discrimination and surveillance often gets overlooked if we frame the debate only in terms of how AI can accurately or inaccurately um, identify us. Um, if we focus on whether AI is better at identifying you than me, essentially then the solution that comes from that uh, debate is that we should just make AI systems better at identifying all of us. Now that isn't necessarily incorrect because of the reasons I've already given. You, if the AI is used in, in various sort of day-to-day -day contexts, then it needs to be, to be able to identify all of us correctly. However, in many cases, what we're essentially doing, and I'm quoting Julia Powell's here, is, is perfecting instruments of surveillance. Basically, we're saying that um, we need um, AI systems, even if they're used by police, um, for example, to monitor a protest, to be better at, at um, identifying us, essentially helping uh, those in power uh, basically infringe on our rights, to identify whether we attend a protest when we walk down the street, when we enter into a supermarket. None of this, I think, is what most people want. It infringes their privacy and it potentially also infringes other people's rights. Think about the policing context again. We've had for the last two years now since the murder of George Floyd, a sort of global uh, re-reckoning with the, the question of racial justice and particularly the question of racism in the police across the world, uh, particularly in Europe and North America. Uh, people continue to die at the hands of the police in both contexts. And uh, we are seeing across the world, or particularly in Europe, especially as, as well as North America, um, that racial profiling still exists. There are still notions that criminality and ideas of criminality are more uh, linked with racialized people as opposed to others, regardless of actual levels of crime rates. So in that context, if we're promoting 
the use of facial recognition if our societies are more and more using facial recognitions to identify people when they access the public space. In essence, what we're also doing is putting those technological tools on top of an already discriminatory society. In that, set, in, in that context, you'll see have seen many reports, um, for example, one um, in 2019 by the European Network Against Racism and the Open Society Foundations, where they looked at the use of data driven tools in a racist society in Europe. And basically, they showed that, in essence, when we use these tools, essentially, what we're doing is mapping them onto a context of racial profiling. So if the police in one context want to use facial recognition, we have to recognize and assume that those tools will be overwhelmingly more tested and overwhelmingly more used on already over policed communities. Therefore, we have basically this connection between discriminatory technology with discriminatory policing, essentially amplifying and making even greater discrimination against certain, some sort of people. I wanted to raise also that many of the cases of either facial recognition or of predictive policing, where we have seen their disproportionate impact on some communities in Europe, we've seen, for example, the gangs matrix overwhelmingly um, categorizing young black men as, um, as potential gang criminals, which completely did not, um, did not map with the actual uh, conviction rate. So it was completely on the basis of discrimination. In uh, the Dutch context, we saw that um, overwhelmingly predictive policing and other criminality uh, risk assessment systems overwhelmingly profiled young Moroccan men, and in other contexts also uh, Eastern Europeans and Roma. So we're seeing increasingly more and more evidence to show how technological tools when they're combined with already existing policing practices of racial pro profiling, are basically essentially um, amplifying those discriminatory tendencies and also potentially making them worse because they give an objectivity, they give some sort of notion of proof to those trends because a computer is involved, basically. It sort of divorce the, um, they divorce the responsibility of the humans involved to actually say, actually, this is encoded by our computer systems, and therefore they are not racist. I wanted to also add that many of these systems is not just a racial justice angle, but also a youth angle. So in all of these cases, we've seen who is overly profiled by these technological tools, not only racialized men, but young racialized men too. Um, often this hasn't been picked up by the youth movement, but actually it really is a, a, an angle of, 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 of young people too. We are basically suggesting that the privacy of young racialized people matters less than the privacy of others. Uh, we're also saying um, we have to really think about like, can we really say technology is neutral if it's being used in a way that targets already discriminated people? Um, in these cases, young racialized people, young migrants. Um, so in these cases, I, I, I hope that all of these examples that I've basically thrown at you is uh, enough to say that the AI debate on facial recognition and other technologies is not just about this question of identification. It's also much deeper than that. And it requires us not just to think about how we can improve the technology, um, but also how can we sort of reform society much more generally. Um, Considering that we can't just reform society in one piece of AI legislation, we cannot do that, that's way beyond scope. What we do have to recognize is that some uses of AI will inherently amplify discrimination. You cannot change that. You cannot fix it with a technical tweak in the system. You cannot make the data better because the data and, and the context in which the system is used is already one that is seeped in discrimination. Essentially, then what we have to do then is think that there are some uses of AI that cannot be used because they will only amplify discrimination. And this includes predictive policing systems. This includes systems that risk assess people on the basis of historical data um, to predict whether they are going to potentially commit crime in the future. These are AI systems which um, risk assess people on the basis of recidivism and therefore um, have uh, have implications on the sentencing 
and it includes the use of facial recognition in the public space. All of these things are not just about accuracy, but they're about whether or not they specifically target certain communities. And we've seen with the evidence that they do. Um, so I think one thing is that we, we would say for the AI regulation is that they need to make sure that they that they um, that they draw red lines on these uses of AI that we've talked about. Um, one thing beyond the AI regulation, I think that the people can do is join the Europe wide movement to call for a ban on facial recognition in public spaces, which is called reclaim your face and over 60 organizations are um, leading this campaign to basically call for a ban on biometric mass surveillance technologies across Europe. Essentially what we're looking, we are running a European uh, citizens initiative, which is a petition by which we ask for 1 million signatures to call on the European Commission to implement basically a legal ban on facial recognition in the public place. And um, so I will share that link with you and I would really recommend that people, if you're a EU citizen, um, sign the Reclaim Your Face petition and it's one really positive and immediate thing we can do to stop this. Well, thank you very much, uh, Sarah. It was uh, super interesting. I was overwhelmed by the so many examples that you gave us. Uh, so many things to reflect now, because um, at the beginning of this conversation, I was completely thinking about that. How can we introduce improvements to the technologies? How can we, you know, make these techniques work? So, so for people of color, for racialized, racialized people, for let's say minorities that are oppressed. But after talking to you, I see that Indeed, like the, the question is not only about improving the technique, but also putting it in a right context. And I like the fact that you highlighted that, well, these techni techniques usually are, let's say, in the hands of big tech corporates. And, and it is also about putting these technologies in the right hands and democratizing tools. Um, yeah, I was surprised because there's so many accurate and, and, and sensitive, te sensitive techniques and I was just imagining how what what we could do if we just put them at the service of the people and the minorities and and so on. And yeah, I don't know. I have so many things to reflect about after talking to you that I just want to thank you. And um, yeah, just thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Adria. Um, and this concludes our conversation for today. Uh, thank you all for your participation and most importantly, thank you very much, Sarah, for your time and your insights on these very important questions for, for Europe and for European citizens. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for watching. We, have, we hope you have found this conversation interesting. Our next, next conversation will be released in the upcoming weeks. Until then, take care.